Fighting goose back in the lab with the pen and the pad Making everyone mad, asking themselves how come they can't predict like the king Who can't seem to stop winning, winning for him and his team So it seems, all that's left is in the end, his enemies have to turn into friends Like the old saying goes, don't step on his toes, he's known to eliminate his foes Even the ones pretending to be his bros So instead I think they'd rather sit back and let him help make their money grow and all that starts by you enjoying and taking notes on these shows. Hello YouTube fans, MMA fans, and UFC fans. We're back to get you another episode for this weekend's uh, Korean Zombie versus Dan 50K, who wants to be called 75K now after what Tony Ferguson helped uh, UFC do, UFC's roster uh, with increasing their bonus fighting of the performance of the night bonus from 50 to 75 so he wants to be called according to his recent interviews 75k Ige doesn't uh, ju just as good of a ring I think all right uh, today's episode in reference to well that's the headline main event we're gonna we're not gonna talk about that app on this episode but we will be talking about that fight on another episode coming uh, later on this week because i always do the main event as a part of my three fights but today's fight is a uh, special request from my beloved patrons who all voted mostly on this fight like last week if you remember they were uh the ones who voted on faraz ziam uh, versus uh luigi vandermini and very wise of them to do that. I'm glad they did. So you all out there, all those people who thank me for the Xeon pick, you could, you should be thankful for my patrons because they're the ones who voted for me to break down and predict that fight. And from what I was uh, aware of, and I think I told you guys this in the video as well, that every other handicapper was picking Xeon to lose. And I told you guys the opposite. As Yam had the real had really good takedown defense, and I said it just looked bad because he was up against opponent who were strong wrestlers and much bigger. For the first time, when I did my research, I realized Luigi would not be able to hand. So remember, I always envision the fights. But long story short, uh, you guys owe it uh, to the patrons for voting on that as one of their uh, fights to pick. And I asked them to vote based on not what they want to hear just because it's fun i, I, I asked them to put, vote for the fights that are the more difficult ones the guys who are lined up close to pick and people are torn between so not only it has good value which that one did uh it was up and down i think it got to like minus 140 where we got it locked in at when i uh, made the breakdown and j it came to fruition uh, the the fight did play out as I expected it and said it would, and uh, hopefully everybody wants some money, and that's what we're gonna do again today. Today's episode is for the guy, the uh, guy he just beat. I almost said Sean Woodson because that's who he just beat. Sean Woodson just got defeated by uh, Glass Chin uh, Julian Arosa. I don't know if that's his real nickname, but that, that's what we're gonna give him as his nickname. Against uh, so oh God, I'm not even gonna try this. Song Sung Woi Choi. He's the only Choi on the card, so we're gonna call him Choi. Okay, uh, Sung Woi Choi and this guy getting matched together. I'm, I'm I'll be honest, I'm a little bit surprised. I'm not surprised actually. The more I think about it, is because UFC and uh, Julian Arosa they have they have a pretty bad history I was very surprised to see when they brought him back again for the third time this is a guy they released they don't they they dislike this guy so much that when he after he lost his first uh, interaction his first um, get together with UFC was on the tough series with uh um, Conor McGregor versus uh, Uriah Faber's team, the California kid, and uh, he made it pretty far. He got like, this is a guy who I'll explain you. against the low. He, you know where he is. It's very confusing, and I see why UFC keeps bringing him back. It's a good way to gauge 
where their prospects are at. Depending on how they do against them, UFC will know where they belong in their rankings and in how to be, if they should be behind them or if they're just somebody who's going to stay just to fill up the lower prelims and fill up the cards when they don't have enough fighters. During COVID, you got to remember, they, they, have to have, they have to have an abundance of backup fighters and fighters ready to go on the short notice. So that, 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 I guess that's got to be the only reason they keep bringing him back is for that reason because uh, and, and to gauge the distance, to gauge, to gauge uh, the level of where their his opponents, their prospects are because they keep bringing him back. Mind you, he lost against Artem Lobov, the GOAT. <laughs> they they uh, fought in the final series, the the final series of the tough season for McGregor and Faber. And he got him out of there really quickly. It was a first round TKO. So no surprise, you know, that we didn't know much about him at that point. Before that, he was like a, he was a big deal in the in the smaller organizations. He never fought out of those like really big, you know how like you have those back, uh, before UFC, you have like, uh, you have like uh, Bellator, sometimes they come from, um, they, they, you have PFL, you have LFA, uh, Cage Warriors, I think, is another one. But he came out out of uh, what was it called? One of them. Uh, it was called Prime Prime something. Never heard of it, really. Nobody really fought out of there. And the other one, was Cage Sports. So not to be confused with Cage Warrior. This Cage Sports is a bootleg version of Cage Warrior, so it had a bunch of cans. So he was able to even successfully obtain two titles. He was a double champ, but he was also fighting in a weight class that he's way too big for. He was going up and down, like, you'll see, finally they started to match him up with people in his, uh, like, this upcoming fight, this is going to be the first time he's actually got somebody who's going to be his size and strength, and he's not going to have a six, like, even the guy who knocked him out, Irish, the, the, another guy who came off of a, the Japan uh, Ultimate Fighter show or Road to Japan show. So uh, that guy who had a five-inch reach disadvantage was able to knock him out early in the second round while he was backpedaling. So that means he didn't even throw the punch the proper way. He couldn't use his hips. He threw it the least the wrong way and was still able to drop him and get a TKO. And we seen late Nate Landwehr, who's got a real big disadvantage as well in size and reach. Dropped him in the first minutes of the first round. He got right back up because it wasn't a big shot. He Like, people dropped this guy with jabs. So I don't want to imagine what is going to happen. And uh, his opponent, Su Wong Choi. Uh, oh, yeah, my point was before I got sidetracked. They don't want this. They think so low of this guy that when he came after the tough series, he couldn't make it. He was trying everything he can to find any way to sneak through the doors. He From the tough house thing, he went to the Dana White contender series now. A different episode, a different series and method of trying to work his way into the UFC. What happened in there? Okay. He actually got a knockout against a decent guy, Jamal Emmers. Pretty good, uh, you know, career for the most part. Another guy, low level, somewhat, uh, you know, um, you could say he's he's one of the better. You know, I'm not even. He, he's just he's a low level guy as well. But he he got a finish off. I think if they had played that back more often than not, he wouldn't. This would have never happened. But he was lucky enough. I or not lucky. He probably he was desperate enough to want to get into the UFC that he actually land. Uh, he actually got the TKO win. And we've never seen, have we ever seen where a guy, like sometimes it happens when people win in the Dana White Centennial by decisions, make it like a boring decision. Uh, sometimes we see Dana upset and say, all right, no, I'm not giving him a contract or I'm not giving her a contract. That's happened in an occasional, even that's not as uh, common. But uh, this guy got a knockout win and they still didn't want to give him a contract. He could, they didn't give him a contract. So that didn't do it for him. He had to go back back to those uh, fly-by-night shops, those little mom-and-pa shops, cage sports, whatever it was called. And then he did good. He fought one more time. His first fight there, he won the belt again. Then they kept calling him back again just for Dana White. It seems like it was a trend. They only want him to fight against new guys coming off the Dana White series or the 
uh, Ultimate Fighter Series. Uh, one of the guys that he went to a split decision win against, it was very controversial. A lot of people thought that the guy, Marcin, <clears throat> uh, how do you say his name? I'll find it for you guys. It's a very difficult name, so even when I find it here in a second, I probably won't be able to pronounce it. Where is this guy? Mar all right, Marcin Resort Wizzwerzok. Wizzwerzik. He went to a split decision, but this guy fought. Not only was he also at a disadvantage, he was smaller, shorter. He fought the absolute worst game plan you could have ever done against a guy like Julian Oroso. He he gave him the perfect way to be in the fight. The fight, every time Julian was doing his typical uh, charging in, uh, chin up, hands down. His his. Can you imagine a guy with the worst chin in the world? This guy maybe arguably have the worst chin in the world. Charges it. That's how he got knocked out on his uh, Terutu Ishara. He charges in. Mind you, he's got an advantage of five inch reach advantage. Why are you charging in even if you have a good chin? No good IQ. So that's chalk it up to no good. He charges in on a guy with a five reach disadvantage who's known for knocking people out. And he's surprised to see when he charged in, no hands up, chin held high, that he gets knocked out. I mean, like, unless you're fighting pillow fists, people with, like, even, these are four or five, you don't have to be a big Mike Tyson knockout artist. The chin is very sensitive. It's like a magic button behind it. And then you're wearing four ounce gloves. It's almost like a bare knuckle. So bad IQ, but I think he was just so desperate. He knows that UFC is going to... One fight he lost last time, they were they, they threw him out again. So he, he's got that mentality, and when you have that much extra added pressure outside the pressure of the regular things, like fighting itself, when you're in a fight, there's a lot of pressure and anxiety just normally, but when you have that added to the normal stuff, knowing that, man, I'm going to lose my job, you don't fight Calm Cool Collective. You don't fight uh, in a way where you're planning and setting things up. You, you, you're, you're desperate, and desperate measures you know, can lead to b bad uh, situations happening. So he f he paid for that. Um, the only reason why he even did well again the in the Sean Woodson fight. Oh yeah, yeah. He got they called him again for Devonte Smith. Before I forget, Devonte Smith, another guy from the Tough series. Um, so even that that, that guy uh, Ishiara, he that was his first win in the UFC. He had never won before that. It was his first official fight in the UFC. And so besides like the content, I mean, the Tough House uh, Japan fight, I mean, when he was in the Tough uh, Road to Japan show, but his actual first real fight, that was his first fight and first win. And, and he's a guy we've learned that is not high level. He's not going to be a top 20, top 15 guy. So that's why it makes sense to me that even um, even in his wins, they don't see them as impressive. It's more so of a mistake. Like his Sean Woodson fight, he had to drag it to the deeper waters in the third round after Sean Woodson was drained and, uh, you know, exhausted. He was winning the fight, by the way. So uh, Erosa, did, I don't think, was going to uh, get the decision in that fight. But it was close. But again, this is a guy who's too small. He's not as small in the size of reach, but the guy is too weak. He was able to put in a submission... Like, and that's the thing, Rosa's thing is he doesn't go for takedowns because he's not a good wrestler. He's a good defensive grappler, but there's a difference between defensive grappling and offensive grappling. So if he tries to initiate takedowns, he knows that he can get caught with something big and his chin is not built for that. It seems like he's come to terms with his chin not being good. So that's why we've seen him in his Nate Landwehr fight, his, his other most recent fight. He immediately came out like a... Now, this is difficult to say why. I don't know if it's because he's come to terms with his bad chin. Because the thing is, if you study tape on Nate Landwehr, Nate Landwehr is a guy who's known to be a slow starter. So if I'm a coach and I did my research on Nate, I would say you got to rush him. My microphone here.
Okay, sorry about the difficulties. We're back. Okay, uh, yeah, so where were we? Uh, shesh. Nate Landwehr is a guy who I would have told my fighter that you can't wait to explode. You got to go fast right off the bat and give him a flurry and give him. It was the best game plan that you could have used. So it could have been because of some coach, good coaching, good strategizing, because that's the way you got to fight Nate. You can't keep him in the fight for the whole three rounds because he starts to get more pressure and more pressure. He starts to squeeze the air out of you like a balloon. And at the end of round, and at the end of the fight, you're gassed out because he mixes in wrestling. So he's a difficult guy to fight with in the later rounds, when you, especially if you're not a cardio freak. So uh, and he just gets better. It's not even about uh, you getting more tired against him. He just seems to be in bet more in rhythm. More uh, he, he by then he's got his feeling out process and he's gauged the distance and he knows where where to stand and move around. He's figured you uh, and your timing out. He's very good at adjustments in the middle of the fight so he's the guy that's your best bet if you're, especially you're a chinny guy like Arosa you got to go straight out the gate go for broke he did that he almost got dropped I mean he did get dropped but afterward he was able to get the finish but it wasn't from like a punch he doesn't have one punch knockout power it took a flying knee and Nate putting his head down like it was like a chicken uh, two cars playing chicken that's how it, they collided perfect it was just a, a luck. I mean, I can't say it's lucky because he does that flying knee in almost all of his fights. So it's a thing he likes to do. Hardly ever has it ever connected. It usually just gets like brushed off. It just in this case, uh, it was good luck, bad luck for Nate because he was going, to, his head was moving down at the same time. I don't know what he was doing, if he was looking for a level change or cha uh, try to uh, go for, I don't know what he was going for, but he was going, his head met perfectly with uh, with uh, Erosa's knee, and that's how he got that fight done. And before that, the Woodson fight, man, Woodson is just, he had, he's like a fish out of water when you get him down there. So he was, he, he, he didn't even use any takedowns. He slapped the submission on while they were standing up. It almost looked like Sean was just not expecting it or that he didn't think like it was it was weird to just see him sitting there letting him do it to him i don't know if he was just too fatigued it was like two three minutes into the final round after they had a high pace fight so three rounds of a high pain and the discrepancy between the strength the strength of uh erosa who's not a strong guy but woodson is super he's like a he should be like a anthem weight he looks that skinny but he's so big and tall it's impossible they can't. He can't be in the other division. That's just, he's he's stuck in in that division because how big he is. So uh, it's not. But it wasn't a surprise. Sean Woodson is not a high level guy. Um, we've seen him, I guess, do well against Zalal. But that's because Zalal fought, you know, in his realm. He he kept him comfortable, and didn't do. Uh, he he didn't do what uh, we saw. Erosa do he didn't he didn't uh, threaten with submissions and do stuff that made him uncomfortable so uh, you know Zalal is another guy who we can't trust to do what he's supposed to do I've said that if you look in my folder for Zalal the first sentence is he's not somebody we can trust to win a fight and use the correct game plan that's the only thing I know about that's one of my most important things I have to say about Zalal who, who did he fight most recently uh, that I said the same thing about him can't remember. I said that uh, he has a clear path to victory, but chances are he won't use it. Who was it that uh, he could have wrestled with, and he he, he wasn't doing enough wrestling, and it cost him a fight? I don't. I don't remember. Who cares? He, he's irrelevant. Uh, but uh, yeah. Um, so no matter what, like this guy, he let's see how many times he's been knocked out. No matter what, win, lose, or draw. Nobody's going to be able to tell me that the smarter bet is not uh, Swing Wui Choi. Because if, remember, this guy, okay, so let's do this. If your boss is giving you, uh, you fighters that are with zero, zero wins, no wins in the UFC, guys like uh, Ishirata who never had a win before, guys who are coming like Marcin who just came out of, uh, his his uh, ultimate fighting championship uh, series. If he's giving you guys who are low level, unheard of, unestablished guys, and some of them are giving you're going to split decisions and losing 
to those guys. The other guy gave him a knockout even. Now compare his opponent. Who did they give him? Gavin Tucker when he was almost nearly undefeated besides one loss against Rick Glenn. He was undefeated before that and he's a, at the time he, he was known as a, a dark horse of some sort. He was doing really good. Uh, so they gave him a guy who was high, high level, established, somebody who, who was uh, going to, and they didn't even make him, I think he was a pick'ems. It was a pick'ems fight. So that's how much they think about, that's how highly they think about Choi. After that, who did they give him? What was it before that? No, before that. It was before Gavin Tucker, they gave him Mazvar Evelov. And uh, we've seen Evelov, an undefeated guy. What is he, like 15-0 and 0 or something like that? Uh, he's, he's a very high level, one of the highest level. That guy is truly going to be probably a future champion one of these days. So he, he's got what it takes to be. He's like the Khabib of their division. They give him one of the best people in the division, the, the dark horses, time and t- back to back. And he held, a good, he held a good account of himself. In the Evelov fight, he had some success, great moments. And you know how he fought. He's a great wrestler as well. So let me tell you this. Uh, between these two guys, Erosa and Choi, the better grappler and wrestler is actually Choi. He's got the way better grappling. Defensively, no. Defensively, we'll, get, we'll have to give the gra- and submissions and stuff like that. We're, we'll give it to Erosa. But I don't think he'll be able to easily get it to that point because this is a guy who also used to fight at a weight above. He used to fight against 155 pounders, 150 pounders in catch weight. So he's finally a guy who's got almost just about the same reach, same height, same same strength. Actually, I might even no, I take that back. Choi is the stronger of them. So physically, now he's fighting a guy stronger than him, just as long a Muay Thai champion this guy's a world champion uh, i think 2010 2000 i can't remember but he was a muay thai champion he was also a champion in his older league his other uh organizations he held the championship and defended it successfully twice so he's another guy who's got the same history same credentials He's, he started fighting a little bit later, if I'm not mistaken. You'll see, yeah, it was like five years later when he made his first debut, but he did it in a better way. Most of all of his wins before getting into the UFC were all knockouts, knockouts, knockouts. So guy who doesn't really, we can't say yet Erosa is UFC material because he's losing to guys who are not UFC material. And they even wouldn't want they didn't they know him better than anybody else they studied him they got his resume when you sign up for the ultimate show ultimate fighter show and when you try to get a job with the ufc you got to show them your whole life so they know him better than anybody else and they did not want to give him a contract after actually getting a knockout which is the whole point of the show you got to try to finish your uh fight finish your opponent impressively to get a contract and what could be more impressive than a knockout? You couldn't get a contract. So that shows there's a reason why they're not high on him, that they only use him. Actually, matter of fact, he wouldn't have even been in the UFC right now if it wasn't for what he was He was filling in as a replacement for to fill in in the, um, the Sean Woodson fight. He took somebody's spot in short notice because they had visa issues. They were unable to fly into the fight and make the fight. So they had to cancel him out due to visa uh, immigration I- issues. So he couldn't trans- they couldn't uh, transport the fighter to where the location would be. And he- they called on a guy who they knew would be desperate for taking any fight for the UFC. So that's the reason. And he got the win. So because he got the win, they gave him another fight. And, and Nate, <laughs> that Nate fight, he was the third string. Two people had to cancel... They was the third guy who filled in. Two people canceled before he got the Nate fight. So, uh, again, they they don't want him around. They don't think he's somebody that uh, is UFC caliber. And we don't have to, we, we cannot deny that uh, a guy like Choi, who's already got wins over Zalal, who's got plenty of wins, who people used to be very high on in the UFC. And perfect example of why I think he'll do good as well is his other opponent before Zalal, Funny enough, it was on the Korean Zombie card, so I think he likes to fight on the Korean Zombie card for 
uh, for because him and Korean Zombie could be uh, may, maybe a tra- uh, friends or training partners. Just like how we see Adesanya always like to tra- fight in the same card as Brad Rydell or vice versa. Rydell likes to fight in the so we don't. But he trains out of a good team. He trains out of more than one. He goes back and forth from Tenth Planet. Um, if I'm not mistaken, no, that that's uh, Arosa. No, Arosa fights out of Tenth Planet. I'm sorry, Su Wong Choi. He fights out of um, Mob Training Center. So we don't know. We don't know who goes there, who who he doesn't. But that doesn't necessarily mean he's tied down to one gym. Uh, that he he can very well uh, go to other places, but not make them who represents him in his fights so, or who corners him. So that's why he just shows. So this doesn't mean, don't, don't, don't think that just because you see just one gym, that uh, that means that, that that's who they're tied down to only. But anyway, oh yeah, what I was trying to get at is the point is Suman Mokhtarian is a guy who UFC, again, wants to see where is he at? What kind of level is this guy on? He had, he had like uh, eight wins and only one loss. At the time, again, it was against Sadiq Youssef. Sadiq Youssef is not an easy fight for anybody. The guy was, he's a beast. He's one of the top 10, 15 worthy fighters. He, look how much trouble he gave to Arnold Allen. And, and before Arnold, uh, he beat Mike, uh, what's his name? Um, in a, in a, I think it was, uh, what's his name? Somebody I'm really high on. I like a lot. Uh, Mike Davis, yeah, he beat Mike Davis in the Dana White Contender sh- Series. So we've seen how, how he looked like a beast, and Mike Davis is a beast. So uh, uh, Suman had lost to him, but other than that, Suman was an undefeated prospect. They wanted to see how he's doing. He was training out of uh, Australian top team. So they were high. They thought this guy could be somebody big. And he had same thing like Arosa. He was really known for having a lot of submissions, and that was really his usually his best path to victory. Like ninety something percent of his wins were from uh, submission. The guy went all three rounds with him. He he won unanimously. He beat him. He more than doubled his numbers, total numbers and significant strikes. He more than doubled uh, Suman. So that just shows that when you're putting him against low-level guys, new prospect guys, he's not making it a competitive fight. When you put him against high-level fighters, he's get, making it a, little, a competitive fight. Even though he's losing, he's doing a good job, holding a good account of himself. So, uh, yeah, Gavin Tucker was desperate to get that win. He choked him out, and that was his, you know what happened there? It happens a lot. We've seen it happen in this most recent event with uh, Jamal Hill versus uh, Paul Craig. Craig, uh, what's his name? Paul Craig. Jamal knows he's a good wrestler. He's wrestled a lot. He's a very good wrestler. He's got re- he's got good re- wrestling credentials, and a lot of people don't know that about him. So maybe he felt to because he doesn't show. He doesn't need to. You the fight starts on the feet. You got an easy path to victory. You got good hands. You got speed. You got good boxing movement, uh, volume. No need to wrestle. You can make it an exciting win. So he never uses it, but he actually has good wrestling on paper. So uh, for Craig, go, being a guy who's a, just a primary submission specialist, kind of sub or bust, and we've seen what he did to even an undefeated Magomed off, he pulled guard and he went into his guard, just like we saw Ronda Marcos do to Mackenzie Dern. Same thing, um, same thing, uh, we saw Choi do against Tucker. Tucker was initiating because they're too proud. They think that, and that's a good thing, a fighter should have that because proud is associated with confidence. You don't want to, you don't want your fighter not to have confidence, but uh, there's got to be a line between like, look, I know I'm a good wrestler, but why give him that, uh, why give him that, uh, why give him a chance? Why make it easier for him? So he's obviously also a good wrestler. He's a good submission specialist. Let me make him stand back up. Let me let me have the referee stand him back up. Instead, he jumped into the guard. And it's easy for us from the outside to say, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Are you stupid? 
But a fighter, I understand. I get it. I get it. It's when somebody tells you you can't do something, you shouldn't do something. You're too a guy like him who's overly kind. He's un, he was undefeated, especially. He's gonna be too proud. He felt invincible. When you're undefeated, you're in the UFC, you're getting finishes like the most recent finish, OSP. He felt untouchable, invincible, and he learned. This is a learning lesson for him, and it'll make him a better fighter in the future. But I was still shocked. I mean, I, I understand it, but I was shocked to see him actually still do that. Uh, but anyway, uh, so, yeah, so Su Wong Choi engaged in the grappling and wrestling because he also is a good wrestler, but... Uh, Gavin Tucker being, remember when I told you about two guys, even if one guy's the better wrestler, but the other guy's stronger, he's going to win that battle most times. So G Gavin being desperate for a finish because they had just taken a point away from him. So it was, he, if he did not get a finish in that round, it was possibly going to go to a draw or he could have even lost. He, he wasn't, Faraz is up, the guy that trained, uh, GSP was on his corner and he, he was giving him good advice so that's why they got the finish but Choi helped them he helped them by not trying to disengage from the grappling and he got flatlined and tapped out but that's not very likely that's not very common and Erosa is not going to be a Gavin he's not going to use that type of a game plan and again that was in the later rounds when he was gassed out he was using a high pace, and especially in the beginning of the third round, he came out more ferocious, ferocious like a bat out of hell, even faster pace than in the first two rounds. So that tells me that he's got great cardio. And being, you know, with his credentials, man, yeah, again, Julian Arosa is not a guy who uses that type of chain wrestling or type of uh, grappling uh, heavy game plan. So I'm not concerned about that. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fun and it's going to be safe, I think, to see. I think this is going to be a, a fight where he can shine. He can finally have a guy who's not going to be trying to wrestle FM every second of the fight. Even uh, even Zalal was trying to use wrestling against him. But uh, now he's got an opponent who's mostly going to just tr uh, try to stand up and get a knockout. He's going to be desperate for a, a fast knockout. My assumption is he's going to do what he did in the... He's going to do what he did in the... Uh, Iroshida, Iroshida, the Japanese guy uh, who got his first win. He'll probably do something similar to that. He's going to be desperate. He did it with Nate. Nate was just uh, unlucky. It was like playing Russian roulette. He had actually... No, he did it with Nate after hurting him with a knee. A flying knee got, got him wobbled. And then he tried to get into... He did his usual stand-up, uh, chin held high, and the hands low. Uh, so I imagine that he hasn't fixed his defensive striking. He hasn't fixed his offensive wrestling. And unless he fixes either one of those, the right pick... Win, lose, or draw, the smarter pick, the more durable guy, the guy with more paths to victory, more advantages, is going to be Su Wung Choi. And remember, this guy's got accolades. Uh, even though they were both champions and stuff, uh, we we don't see the same accolades. In, in, as far as an impressive resume, um, the more impressive one out of them would be... Um, his, uh, let's see what he got here. South Korea Muay Thai National, uh, four time. Uh, this he got this four times. He was a four time Muay Thai World Champion and 2010 bronze medalist in the Muay Thai World Championships. So. Uh, yeah, man, that guy's got uh, his stand-up is pretty pretty intense. Even Evlov was having trouble with him, and he was trying his best to get him down. And he was showing great takedown defense with Evlov, and Evlov is a freak, freak of nature. So uh, if he held that good of an account of himself in the Evlov fight and did so well for all three rounds up until the finish, the one mistake he made in the final round of Gavin Tucker, and seeing what he did to the... A uh, person before Yusuf Zalal, the submission specialist, who he gave all his second and only loss. And then, obviously, what we saw him do to Yusuf Zalal, who's another guy who's, like, kind of low level, but he usually wins against the other low. So he's, like, top of the low level guys. Yusuf Zalal is, like, middle to higher low level tier. He had no trouble. He made it a... Made, 
he he didn't even he wasn't even a close fight. He dominated. So he shows that there's levels between him. And now I get why UFC was not. Uh, were they were willing they were not afraid of putting him in with the guys who are some of the best in the division so there's levels to it there's durability concerns with the rosa and so far the reasons too many reasons i've listed you've got to pick uh su wung choi and i don't I, you know remember he was getting a lot of, even though he hasn't gotten finishes in the ufc yet this guy was getting tons of finishes before the UFC. A lot of them, doctor stoppages, TKOs, KOs. He got a, he had a lot of finishes before, and those were against medium level guys. That who do you think Arosa is? Arosa should not even be considered like a mid level UFC or even a low level. He should be considered not UFC level. So it doesn't. It wouldn't surprise me to see him uh, fall the same way as many of the other opponents who are low level. So. I know the, the decision prop is probably going to look enticing, but this is one of those that um, I may even slightly lean towards the uh, Choi by knockout prop. So maybe you want to do like a what I do when I'm uncertain. I do like a three leg, four leg parlay, and I'll put one by money line and the other one by a prop bet. And then you can even put another one with a prop bet. Um, but uh, it's got to be in a safe parlay so that when one of them wins, it covers you, ensures you. Look, I'm giving all my secrets. If you're in the Patreon, don't worry. The bets will be made for you. All you've got to do is copy them and duplicate exactly how I do them. I don't just give them my personal bets, how I bet it. I give them instructions and explain what I did, what I'm doing, and what they're supposed to do. How much money of theirs should I, I let them know to the penny exactly how much money they're supposed to put in every single bet. So I'm also given my color circle picks, color coordinated picks, where it shows I circle my winning, my the winners who I expect to win in three different colors. Low adversity, no little to no adversity, medium adversity mid-level adversity or high risk for a high adversity fight so that shows like don't parlay this guy medium level if you're gonna parlay him or you're better off uh, not making a big wager or making a single bet and then the low level to no level adversity are the best parlay pieces the safest miss biggest mismatches so i do that for you guys every week i give you my prop bets like the very high likely ones that we always hit um so that's a perk of being in the Patreon. Just the, the prop bets alone pay itself off. One prop bet. How many times have we seen plus 700, plus 2,000 prop bets cash in? So uh, that's the benefit of being in the Patreon. You get my full picks, my explanations, my breakdowns on all the fights. Unlike the channel, the channel only gets my three picks. Main event and two fights that they the patrons pick for you guys to see. So they uh, gave you this one, so I hope you can thank them for this one once again if it cashes in, and I expect it to cash in, even if it's by decision. One way or another, he's going to be the more, uh, the guy's a Muay Thai, I mean, Muay Thai champion. He's not going to get outclassed on the feet, um, and he's not a fish on, out of the water um, on the floor either, especially even on his back. He's actually pretty decent on his back. Okay, guys, thank you for your time. Hit the likes. Hit the subscribe and uh, the bell notification, the reminders, because you, you want to get this information ASAP. It's, it's time sensitive. The lines, they, they move up really fast, so you don't want to miss it. It's a great uh, pick. Um, I mean, a great value pick. The odds are very, very good right now still, so don't miss out on that. All right, uh, if you have any questions, concerns about this fight in particular, if you're a YouTube follower, you can ask it in the comment section. If you have any questions in general about any fights, if you're a Patreon member, you can ask it um, in the Patreon. We have direct messaging inside the Patreon. Or if you have questions about the memberships or whatever else to do with the Patreon services, my services, you can ask it in the comment section as well. 
All right, and leave a comment. It helps. Just any comment. You just to express your opinions. Who do you think is going to win? How do you think they're going to win? So I'd love to hear some some of your thoughts on on the fight or uh, about the card in general. Who are you, who are some of your locks? Share with me who you guys are the most confident in, or who's your best underdogs. I love talking MMA with you guys, so you know that's my passion. I don't do this because of the money. I do it because I enjoy it as I'm sure you guys have uh, already been aware of it. So that's why I do so good at it is because I enjoy it. And when I watch tape, study tape, I don't feel like I'm doing work. It's more more fun for me. So I, I always have time for it. All right, guys. Uh, so uh, I look forward to talking with you again. There's going to be one more video coming up this week. Or no, I think this is the first UFC video. we got two more UFC videos coming out. And one more PFL video, and that's it. You ain't getting no more of me ever again. No, I'm just kidding. All right, guys, thank you. See you on the next one.